Uh, welcome and good morning, everyone. My name is David Corey, and this webinar today is called Emotional Intelligence and Leader Performance Webinar, and we're focusing on the leadership dimension of coaching, and I'll explain more about what we mean by that uh, momentarily. So my name is David Corey with the Emotional Intelligence Training Company, and we are uh, offering these uh, these regular webinars and, and just bringing you little bits and pieces of this this wonderful area of emotional intelligence um, knowledge and uh, information hopefully which is going to help you in your decision making moving forward and with your professional practice uh, and uh, what I thought we'd do just to start us off today was to just find out a little bit about who's on the call today and so we've got our polling question I'm going to uh, to do this and hopefully you see a, um, uh, a the, the question coming up on your screen it should say who's on the webinar today and just click one of the following whether you're a new coach veteran coach new trainer veteran trainer new manager veteran manager HR professional whichever seems to fit best for you and then uh, and then with respect to uh, to other um, please feel free to uh, to simply Use that other box, and then maybe if if the you don't see you know the the label that uh, that that best is most appropriate for the role that you have, uh, just type in the chat box what what uh, whether you're a teacher, counselor, social worker, professor, researcher, etc. Uh, and uh, then I was also interested to know about uh, you know who's taken the EQI. Uh, a, a large percentage of you have have taken the EQI. That's great. Uh, taking the 360, if uh, one of you has, uh, become certified to use the EQI and EQ360, and uh, uh, and that's about 20 at the moment, 22% of you. So okay, great, good. Well, it looks um, it, it the, the the statistics there are really interesting to see who's on the call today. Uh, we've got uh, we we had close to 200 people register for the course, so that's really interesting to know that that people will be getting the recording and, and watching this information. Uh, and uh, Okay, so I'm gonna end the poll uh, and we can review the results. Let's just take a look and see what, uh, share the results. I can share the results with you so you can see that, that we've got about uh, uh, 60, 62 people on the, on the webinar and rising uh, and um, About 23% of you are coaches, 12% trainers, large percentage, 55% HR professionals who probably are also coaches, trainers, etc. Could be mixed in there. Uh, and uh, we've got learning development managers, people who have. Uh, Okay, people who have taken the EQI or plan to take the EQI, uh, and that's interesting as well. Uh, and uh, so, so that's great. Thank you so much for sharing, everyone. Uh, we'll uh, we'll get back to our uh, to our webinar now, and uh, let's move on. So, in terms of of how we're going to cover the information that we've got for you today, uh, I thought we'd start with taking a look at what is coaching in general. That is. Uh, uh, what is this this um, this activity that we call coaching? And then secondarily, why does it matter? Uh, and then we'll take a look at uh, at coaching as a leadership dimension, which might be a little bit different than than the other more general type of coaching that we've that we've described. And and then we'll look at the EQ competencies that are correlated with coaching and see how they support the coaching function. And then I'm going to open it up for questions, and we'll have a bit of a discussion, hopefully, uh, and then we'll summarize for you and let you get on with uh, with your day. Uh, again, so thanks for being here, and the, for those of you who have just joined, my name is David Corey, and I'm with the Emotional Intelligence Training Company, and we have been focused on emotional intelligence for leadership development for the past 19 years. It'll be 20 years coming up in 2018. We're pretty excited about that. Uh, we'll let you know what we've got in mind for some 20-year celebrations, uh, but we'll do that a little bit later. So for now, what is coaching? Well, I, uh, I, you know, wanted to take a look and see what other people say coaching is, and we'll just look at that and and consider that for a moment. Uh, so here's here's one definition. 
uh, it's unlocking a person's potential to maximize their own performance. Uh, I like that one, unlocking a person's potential. Uh, and uh, so, so that's, uh, that's a good definition. A, a collaborative, solution-focused, result-orientated, and systematic process. Um, you know, some, some great uh, ideas there. I love the idea of, of it being collaborative uh, and uh, solution-focused, result-oriented. Uh, a professional partnership between a, call, a qualified coach and an individual or team that support the achievement of extraordinary results. So, so we are taking people to higher levels of performance, typically when we're talking about the workplace. Uh, and as you know, there are many types and kinds of coaching out there. There's life coaching, there's, there's executive coaching, there's business coaching. Uh, and uh, I, I guess what we like to think that we do is, is business coaching, that we are interested in improving the results that a business is able to get by using coaching to, for that purpose. So, uh, so that's one of the, the ideas that we're going to focus on. Uh, here's another one, the art of facilitating the performance. So that, again, that, uh, that facilitator, that person that, um, uh, that works with, that partners with, in order to, uh, to see improved performance, learning and development of another. Coaching is about developing a person's skills and knowledge leading to the achievement of organizational objectives. There's that connection with organizational objectives, which is, which is always good. Psychological skills and methods are employed in a one-to-one -one relationship to help someone become a more effective manager or a leader. Uh, and there's a, a word coactive, which um, which I first learned about from the international or from CTI rather, the Coaches Training Institute. This word coactive, uh, that coaching is a powerful alliance designed to forward and enhance a lifelong process of human learning, effectiveness, and fulfillment. So there's a great definition as well. I really like the idea of um, lifelong process, um, and this this word fulfillment. Uh, is also an interesting word, which which we'll take a look at uh, also in the in the webinar. Coaching is about enabling individuals to make conscious decisions and empowering them to become leaders in their own lives. So, as you can see, many definitions, many uh, many ways of thinking about coaching, but all with some commonality there that we are actually partnering with, working with another. Uh, to achieve some end for that individual. Uh, and so why does it matter? Why would we be concerned about, about that? This was an infographic or, or rather a, um, uh, a, a, um, a, a graphic documentation of a presentation at the, uh, uh, at the ICF Vancouver, uh, where myself and a number of other presenters all presented on various aspects of coaching. Uh, and I thought that it was a really interesting that, that, that there were some, uh, some key uh, elements that I wanted to bring into this conversation, one of which was coaching as a key driver of engagement uh, in, in teams and organizations, uh, and this, this whole idea as a manager, as coach, versus an expert, versus the sage uh, guide, versus a sage, uh, and, uh, and coaching as a management competency, that this is a really important part of management and leadership. Leaders must coach to facilitate uh, teams, uh, and, um, uh, and, and you can see some of the things that, that were recorded. Uh, there's my piece on, on coaching and emotional intelligence, uh, and uh, where I really wanted to talk about how it leads to employee engagement, uh, and, uh, and where, wherever there is greater connection, uh, of course, that's where where we engage with people, where people feel a greater sense of employee engagement. What I really wanted to convey was that uh, that there is a, a whole lot of, of connection between coaching and emotional intelligence. And we have this opportunity to take a look at that here on this webinar today. Now, how do we get to this place of, uh, of competence with respect to, uh, to, to coaching for, for managers? And as, um, uh, as you know, and as we uh, often think about what, the, what we do, the work that we do, is managers get to be managers because, largely because of technical competence. And, and then whether they have the ability to coach and connect with employees and and be good, uh, good leaders of people is, uh, is another question. And so how do we do that? How do we actually drill down and look at whether there is a fundamental set of competencies that leaders require to be effective as leaders? And, and this 
is one model. And as, uh, as a large percentage of you will recognize, this is the model that was originally created by Dr. Ruben Baron in the 80s and was published in the 90s and updated in the 2000s. And this is the latest model. Uh, it is owned by MHS, Multi-L Systems, MHS Assessments. Uh, and they, um, this is the basis for the EQI, the Emotional Quotient Inventory, and the, uh, the EQ360. So this model has uh, the concept of emotional intelligence at the center. Uh, and as you know, there are many definitions of emotional intelligence. But what we like about this model, and maybe what you like about it as well, is that it is a set of skills and competencies, all of which are emotional. So these are emotional competencies. These are uh, are what we call EQ competencies because they determine whether we are effective, that is likely to be correlated with a higher level of EQ or ineffective struggling, often correlated with a lower level of EQ. So we call them EQ competencies. They determine our ability with emotional intelligence. Uh, and you can see that, uh, or you know, that they are divided up into five categories. And the, these 15 are also correlated with various aspects of leadership, which we will, again, delve into a little bit deeper momentarily. So let's take a look at a result of taking the EQI. Here is a page from an EQI report, and you can see that it is a leadership report, which many of you may recognize by the gold bars on the, uh, on the, uh, the bar graph there. The numbers are standard scores, which means that your, your results have been compared with a representative sample of the North American population. The gold bars are, uh, as many of you already know, that, that those gold bars are the range of the top 50% of 220 effective leaders who took the EQI. Those same 220 leaders were also given an assessment which measures competency in four different dimensions. Uh, and that's what, uh, what we're covering now in this current webinar series. We covered authenticity last time. Uh, and today, of course, we're looking at coaching. And we're looking at, at, uh, at coaching as a leadership competency because leaders who coach effectively are seen as mentors, uh, role models who support employee growth. Employees are nurtured towards achieving their highest levels of performance. So again, not that uh, different or, or widely uh, varying from our more traditional or more general notion of what coaching is. However, we're thinking about it a little bit differently as a leadership competency now. Uh, because, of course, uh, leaders uh, have inherent in their role this responsibility, this accountability for employee performance. So how are you going to get those, those ultimate levels of employee performance? How are you going to challenge employees to uh, pursue performance at higher levels, but to nurture them? And it's a great word. It's, uh, uh, it, it conjures up all kinds of images. Um, uh, we, we, and we often talk about emotional intelligence as being part nature and part nurture. The nurture part is what we refer to as the, what is learned about emotional intelligence. And so we need to nurture employees towards achieving their highest levels of performance. And, and this is what we expect. And this is what we, uh, what we desire from leaders. However, that's not always clear with the job description. So people become managers because of their technical expertise. They certainly know the work. They know the job. They know how to get things done. And yet, um, and yet they have these people to support. And so that this is the reason, as many of you know why, we have uh, leaders in our, throughout our careers uh, who have been uh, leaders who we would not consider to be great leaders, who we would uh, often think, why am I working for this person? Why am I putting up with them and, uh, and, and how they treat me? Uh, and it's because they, frankly, weren't prepared for the job necessarily in a systematic or consistent way. And so we still find people in positions of management who are not necessarily great coaches, who don't necessarily nurture their employees towards achieving their highest levels of performance and don't understand what uh, a coach approach would be. So this is the importance of teaching managers about these leadership dimensions and how each one 
contributes to leadership effectiveness. We're going to cover insight and innovation in future, and I hope you join us for those webinars as well. And we'll certainly delve deeper into what underscores or what underlies the, those dimensions. But for now, let's consider what which EQ competencies underscore the leadership dimension of coaching. Here is a, a model showing the various uh, correlations between EQ competencies based on the EQI with these four dimensions of leadership effectiveness. The, by the way, I should mention that uh, Dr. Steven Stein, who is, um, uh, has been our strategic partner in working in the area of emotional intelligence for the past uh, 19 years, um, Steve, uh, as he is known to his friends and colleagues, close colleagues, uh, Steve has written a book called The EQ Leader, which uh, is all about this model. So uh, to look for that, pick it up. Um, uh, I, I haven't uh, had the chance to read it yet, but I'm looking forward to it. But um, uh, it will illustrate many more uh, ideas around these various four dimensions of uh, leadership effectiveness. So again, we're going to focus and zero in on the top right corner of the, uh, of the model here. And we're going to look at uh, self-actualization, empathy, reality testing, interpersonal relationships, assertiveness, and emotional self-awareness as they contribute and support the leadership dimension of coaching. So let's do that. As you'll notice, if you just, just before we move on, as you notice in the four dimensions here, you'll notice that self-actualization is number one, has the highest correlation with each one of the four leadership dimensions. So let's keep that in mind as we move forward. Now, this is uh, a, uh, the front cover of a, um, uh, of a, an assessment tool that we developed, uh, and this uh, allows you to transpose your EQI scores onto the four dimensions of leadership and create some interesting radar graphs to further illustrate your effectiveness as a leader in these four areas. Now, we don't unfortunately sell this as a separate entity, so you cannot yet purchase this from us. This is uh, this belongs to our leadership course, which currently is called the Heart and Science of Leadership. And uh, we've got the women's course up and running. We've run it a couple of times with great results, and we're looking forward to the future of that course. And we hope to offer this course for men starting as soon as uh, January 2018. So stay tuned for that. Uh, and just wanted to show you this, um, uh, this tool at this time. Let's turn our attention to this idea of self-actualization. So self-actualization, as you know, uh, is about our ability to work to our potential, to create a life that is full of meaning and purpose. Uh, and one of the pieces of evidence for, for self-actualization is fulfillment. Uh, do you feel fulfilled in, the, in your role? Uh, and, uh, and it's so important, uh, as we mentioned, that it is the number one uh, EQ competency correlated with each of the four leadership dimensions. So uh, what I've done is I've taken an excerpt from an EQI leadership report, and, and, uh, and we'll just take a look and consider how self-actualization impacts leadership. First of all, uh, individually, so about the in, the individual manager, and then secondarily, what are the organizational implications? So first, we see that uh, we see that the text that is included in the EQI report, which says you are passionate about your leadership role within the organization. So why would someone who scores well on self actualization be passionate about their leadership role? Well, because they find it fulfilling. It has a lot of meaning and a sense of purpose for them. They're inspired. And so, of course, they're, they're going to demonstrate that passion uh, at work. And, uh, uh, and some of you who are familiar with the EQI model might quickly realize that, that, that passion is often connected to optimism as well. So we're really, it's very difficult, as it is very difficult to, uh, to experience only one emotion, it is very difficult to experience or utilize just one of our EQ competencies without it being connected with 
and working alongside other EQ competencies. So that's just an interesting, um, uh, an interesting comment on the way that this model works. So we're looking at them individually, but they actually don't operate individually. So go, moving on. So someone who is living, who is, who is inspired and living life in accordance with their values. That's where we experience self-actualization. Uh, it, it goes on to say, you find ways to ensure that your talents are being optimally leveraged. Yes, there's that idea of being optimally leveraged, working to our potential, do, doing what we're meant to, what we feel like we're meant to do, and, and why, we're, uh, why we're here on this earth. Uh, and uh, we expect the same from the team. Absolutely. It is a fair expectation. Now, of course, individuals uh, are, you know, there's a wide variation on self-actualization among employees. Uh, and part of that may be that they're in the wrong job, viewing their job in the wrong way, dealing with other personal pressures, stresses, et cetera, that are, are you know, reducing their ability to feel optimally leveraged. However, it's up to managers uh, who choose to be leaders to enter into those kinds of conversations and have those kinds of, of intimate relationships with employees to know uh, whether things are going well for them and they feel self-actualized or not. So uh, just again, as is always true when we talk about uh, emotional intelligence or EQ development with uh, our participants in our workshops and courses and our, uh, and our coaching clients, it's all about your EQ, but then as leaders, it's all about the EQ of the leaders who report to you, the EQ of the individuals that you impact on. So how can we consider both and? So we are talking about uh, dedication, your dedication to constant growth. What a great phrase to talk about someone who self-actualized, reverberates throughout the team, and is conducive to exceptional individual and team performance. So, uh, so I, I hope you have that, that sense that, that when we are self-actualized, we impact on others incredibly positively. Uh, so let's look at organizational implications. So you empower employees. That wonderful word, it kind of got a bit overused when it first came on the scene, that word empowerment. Uh, and we kind of maybe shy away from it a bit because it does seem to be an overused word. But it's an extremely accurate word when talking about the new workplace and what we, what we are evolving towards. We are intentionally evolving towards giving away our power as people in positions of power. Uh, and when we do that, of course, that leads to uh, much more highly effective uh, func functioning organizations and effective organizations. So you empower employees to achieve success in their role. You bring out the best in your staff by challenging them with high standards and by inspiring them to surpass their potential. The organization may thrive under your guidance uh, which, uh, with employee morale and fulfillment being a top concern for you. You create an atmosphere so that employees are able to accomplish great feats in their careers. Again, if a manager is struggling with self-actualization, it will dramatically affect their leadership potential uh, and their ability to lead and their ability to coach employees. Uh, we don't coach people if we feel somehow insecure or, or struggling ourselves. We don't, we don't view our uh, ability to interact with employees and, and take a coach approach uh, as, um, as, a, as, as a way. We may fall back on, as we sometimes do in times of stress and pressure, fall back on more of a command and control or autocratic style of, of interacting with employees. So again, I've used this phrase coach approach a couple of times without really defining what it is that I mean. And again, going back to, uh, to some of our, our general definitions of coaching, we talked about this idea of collaborating or partnering or facilitating performance. So really what we're talking about with the coaching dimension of our leadership model is we're really talking about the way we interact with others. So the way we interact, so an employee comes to us with an issue or a challenge, uh, we could probably just tell them what to do, but that's not the way to, uh, to increase engagement. Uh, telling people what to do doesn't develop relationships. It doesn't increase communication. It doesn't help people get to know us as individuals. However, a coach approach does. Uh, let me explain more what I mean by that. 
So a coach approach is when an employee comes to us with an issue or challenge, uh, we immediately try to engage them in a conversation which is about joining forces to come up with a solution. Uh, and there is, a, there is an assumption that underlies the, the Coaches Training Institute where many of our coaches have taken their training because it's a great organization that, that offers great coaching training, uh, the, one of their assumptions is that individuals are creative, resourceful, and whole. So the, the, the idea there is that people already know what they need to do. And so when we ask the right questions, when we facilitate their discovery of that right thing to do, it's, uh, it, it uh, feeds self-regard, it helps people to feel like they're a part of, that they're, con they're making a contribution, they're giving of themselves, it's, there's that connection, there's that partnering and that collaborative approach, which is what coaching, what the coaching dimension of trans uh, transformational leadership, I haven't used that word, but that is really the model uh, that the, uh, the four dimensions is a model of transformational leadership, transforming individuals, transforming organizations. So we've got this, uh, this idea of, uh, of creating an atmosphere so employees are able to, uh, to accomplish great feats in their career. So they feel like they can do that. Uh, and so, so that's the self-actualization piece as it supports coaching in organizations. Let's look at empathy. Now, you may have noticed, let's just go back once, go back to this slide for a moment, that, that self, you see all four dimensions in, under this leadership impact, and that, that is because self-actualization supports all four dimensions. Let's look at empathy. You see that the only one that empathy supports is coaching. Now, that doesn't mean empathy doesn't play a role in other dimensions of leadership, but that it is one of the top six correlations with, with empathy. Uh, sorry, with coaching. Uh, so, so empathy. Um, uh, let's let's consider empathy. Now, I chose the image uh, of the babies. It's because this is kind of an. Uh, it is a. It's instinctual. It's it's almost innate to us as human beings that we are kind of drawn to that we are uh, concerned with. The emotions of others. So empathy is, as you may recall, uh, it is about uh, about paying attention to, appreciating, and then I love Brene Brown's definition of empathy. It's about feeling with others. So if someone else is is um, struggling, someone else is having a difficult time, uh, then then we're then that causes us to be concerned. Uh, and as a leader who's concerned about performance, of course you would be concerned. If one of your team members was struggling, was having a difficult time, going through a difficult personal issue or challenge, of course that would catch your attention. Uh, if, if not for, uh, for altruistic reasons, because you're concerned about the performance of your organization, or the performance of your team. So let's look at the leadership implications as outlined by the EQI. So uh, for you, empathy is a daily active process when resolving conflict, managing change, making tough decisions. Uh, and you know, one, one great uh, old uh, saying about empathy is putting yourself in another person's shoes. And that's exactly what we're asking you to do. So uh, showing empathy allows you to come across as authentic, um, someone who can gain trust and respect uh, I, again, the, the idea that we are revealing something of ourselves, that we are showing concern to another, this is just a good thing uh, and goes against, you know, much, much of what is thought about emotions in the workplace. You know, let's leave emotions out of the workplace. Uh, I, uh, I was listening to a, uh, an interesting uh, program this morning uh, on CBC about the 20th anniversary of uh, uh, Lady Diana's um, death uh, and talking about her impact on the British people and how she, uh, uh, how she caused the, the British people to become more touchy-feely was the, was the quote from uh, the, the guy who wrote her, one of her uh, original biographies, Andrew Morton. He, he said she caused us to open up and become less stiff upper lippish as, uh, as Britons. Uh, I thought it was inter an interesting commentary. 
uh, that, that, and commentary on how the world is changing and how we are becoming more emotional. We're learning more about how we operate as emotional beings. And so these, these skills and these competencies are becoming more and more important as we, uh, as we evolve towards what we are fully capable of being. Uh, now there are certain uh, certain things happening in the world that that might uh, belie that. However, uh, however, you know, and and things that may contradict what I'm saying. How, however, uh, I think that in general we are moving towards a more empathic world. Uh, so uh, uh, watch watch for where your empathic de demeanor may um, may may crack. Uh, that's an interesting uh, choice of words uh, when you're feeling stress or anger and cause an emotional disconnect between you and your employees. That that has to do with another of our competencies, which we're getting to, uh, with related to coaching. So so empathy critical to be focusing on the emotions of others while we are involved in coaching. Uh, them. The organizational implications. Uh, now, this is because this person uh, had, could increase their or improve their, their level of empathy. This person that this report was taken from, it was taken from a sample report uh, in any case. Uh, working to increase it will benefit both you and your, the organization. The need to feel heard and understood is in the core nature of all human beings. Uh, in fact, one conversation book, I think it might have been Marshall Rosenberg's Nonviolent Communication, where, where he wrote that human beings have a need to be understood like we have a need for air and water. Uh, and that is really quite a, a, a startling revelation for a lot of people. So how do we help people to feel heard? Well, we use empathy. We use our empathy skills. Further increasing your level of empathy to provide this validation will help dampen defenses um, in conflict management gain, and gain commitment you need to achieve common goals. So these are some of the ways that empathy support the coaching dimension of transformational leadership. Reality testing. Let's look at reality testing. Do you know someone who needs a reality check? Uh, we probably all do. And uh, we, all, we all can struggle with reality testing uh, in our own work and in our own lives to some extent as well. Uh, and you see the, the graphic there. The, the reason for that is that, um, uh, that my, uh, my colleague, uh, uh, Kim Cairns, and I have uh, done several broadcasts, and, and we've recorded those. And this is an image taken from our, one of our programs on reality testing. We've been through the whole, all 15 competencies twice. So if you're ever interested in learning more about these competencies, please check out those, uh, those different broadcasts. They're all posted on our YouTube channel. Uh, which you can easily find by typing in David Corey or EI Training Company or one of those. Oh, okay, so leadership implications of reality testing. So, um, uh, you know, to, to see, uh, to focus on what is objective uh, and, um, and make sure there's evidence and sort of test out our perceptions, make sure that we're not just relying on our perception alone, but making sure that we are, uh, that, that we are checking it out, that, that we are speaking of a, a perception of reality that is shared by others is going to be really important and set us up as trusted and respected leaders with clear ethics. People seek, seek us out for realistic appraisal of a situation when we're, uh, when we're good at reality testing. Uh, coaching and performance management conversations are likely to be securely grounded in evidence. Uh, again, so... Um, so be careful not to dismiss good intentions and efforts when results aren't meeting your expectations. So uh, reality testing is about evidence. It is about what is objective, what is, uh, what is seen and sensed, and making sure that we include that. But also, again, uh, as mentioned, never relying on one EQ competency alone, but also sort of checking out and seeing what's going on for, uh, for the other person as well. Organizational implications, because you frequently see situations as they are, not as you wish them to be, people likely turn to you for the hard facts uh, and um, to, to make the tough decisions. So you can accur accurately size up external events and solve problems based on this assessment uh, and uh, capable of greater achievements. Watch that your objectivity doesn't get in the way of your creativity and willingness to set stretch goals. So this is referring to the possibility that that when reality testing is, is at a high level, um, are people able to be creative and think out of the box and not simply go by and base everything on uh, what is objective? So we need to get a move away from the numbers sometimes and, uh, and focus on emotions and try to find a healthy balance between that, again, uh, leads to higher, uh, greater levels of effectiveness.
Interpersonal relationships is another one that supports both coaching and the insight dimension of, uh, of our leadership model. And the leadership implications here uh, may be kind of obvious, but we'll review them in any case. But, but this is about maintaining confidences, team harmony, having open communication in relationships in, at work. The features of authentic relationships helps you engage the hearts and minds of your team. Um, and because this person scores higher in this area, they have likely built loyal relationships. And you know people at a very personal level. By maintaining a strong rapport, you can motivate and inspire others towards innovative and challenging goals. So, uh, so as, we, as we seem to get into discussions in every one of our workshops and courses, and even with our coaching clients, the discussion of how workplace relationships are changing over time. Again, we're getting closer. We want to know more. We have the desire to talk about things that really matter and not simply stay with what is superficial or the technical aspects of the job. But we really want to know people. Uh, it makes our work uh, more enjoyable, um, it, you know, and to have that, that trust and that loyalty and that commitment to, and to know that someone has our back it is a re, it creates that feeling of family uh, in the workplace, which uh, and makes, makes the workplace more, you, you look forward to going to, to work in that kind and type of environment. So uh, these are things that we, um, uh, that we need to remind people of. That, um, uh, and people say, well, in my personal relationships, I'm this way. In my work relationships, I'm this way. Well, why does it have to be different? Why can't we have great personal relationships with people we work with? And, and we're always having to try to challenge that status quo. Organizational implications for interpersonal relationships uh, in the workplace, you likely have a commitment to forming healthy interpersonal networks. And of course, this is just going to make your coaching conversations that much better. Uh, and um, uh, again, uh, we're talking about these competencies as they support and as they contribute to the effective uh, use of the coaching dimension of leadership. Uh, and of course, if you've got a good relationship with an employee, it's going to be that much easier to uh, to have a coaching conversation with them about how they can improve their performance, uh, et cetera. And you're letting them know, um, you know, uh, how you, what you give to them in terms of, of, of that relationship, that you're giving them opportunities, that you're giving them uh, respect and dignity uh, that, that comes with not simply telling people what to do. When we tell them what to do, we're saying, "Listen, I don't, I don't respect your uh, your ability to figure this out on your own, and feel like I, you know, I need to tell you." Uh, so, interpersonal relationships uh, is um, uh, is there to support coaching. Uh, assertiveness, assertiveness is. Um, uh, as you know, is the ability to say what you need to say and, and really, you know, to be able to say no when you need to, to sort of draw your personal boundaries, to say this is, um, uh, this is the way things are going to go. This is, this is what the standard is. This is, and a lot of people think that, uh, and, and it really is a, um, a, a mythical uh, idea around emotional intelligence that, that it's about being nice and being kind and gentle. Well, it is partly, but it's also about saying, no, that's not happening. Uh, and you're not working to the standard. Uh, and being able to stand up and have those kinds of, of performance conversations as well. Uh, and uh, with respect to coaching, sometimes you, you, you have to be able to speak up and, and, and say what might be difficult to say. Uh, and uh, here, um, uh, it, it, there, the suggestion is uh, that you um, you likely pull on strong emotions and convictions to state your position. So this person probably has a higher level of assertiveness, uh, and it helps in gaining team buy-in and, and inspiring them towards innovative solutions. Uh, and there are times when people really want to know that you are going to uh, talk about the elephant in the room, that you're that the the one that other people may be uh, uncomfortable to talk about or afraid to talk about, you need to speak up and, uh, and, and address it. Uh, the organizational implications, uh, that you're skilled at getting your point across in, in a clear and confident manner, it's gonna help with respect to resolving conflict, leveraging organizational resources, uh, opening your voice to, uh, voicing your opinion and contributing to the success of your organization. Uh, so I hope you see that 
that assertiveness is a critical and important part of, of leadership and a, and a critical and important part of the coaching dimension of leadership as well. Emotional self-awareness is a, is a piece here are, that supports coaching and how would emotional, why would it be important for me to be aware of my, and in touch and in tune with my own emotions when I'm uh, coaching others? Well, um, let's, uh, let's take a look at what the EQI uh, text is suggesting. It's suggesting that, um, uh, that as a leader, you have a thorough grasp of your emotional triggers and reactions. Uh, this helps uh, fuel a streamlined decision-making process as you incorporate your emotions into your role as a leader. Knowing your emotional triggers and reactions, uh, you are able to use, utilize this, this emotional knowledge to effectively navigate through challenging or difficult situations. So this, it's, it's all about, I, I kind of hesitate to use the word, but I think it's about control. Uh, and you know, when we're more aware, we have more control. Uh, and so we're going to sit down and have a coaching conversation with someone, even though we might be angry about something that they've done or something that they've not done that they should have done. We're able to be aware of that and not simply blast the employee, but sit down and say, and, and perhaps even express our emotions first and say, you know, I'm, I'm actually quite angry about what's happened. Uh, and then take, be able to also take a coach approach. Um, maybe make an assertive statement and take a coach approach and allow people to, again, uh, the, the, allow them the dignity and respect to come up with their own solutions. Uh, that's just going to lead to employee engagement. Organizational implications for emotional self-awareness, uh, your capacity to grasp subtle emotional nuances helps you take calculated risks that help the organization meet its strategic goals. This comfort with and knowledge of your emotional triggers and reactions allows you to lead with authenticity and a candid approach to help you gain credibility and buy-in with employees. You're able to manage tense and perhaps overwhelming situations with these, and you're able to use and recognize your full spectrum of emotions. So again, how emotional self-awareness is connected to so many other of our competencies, including empathy. So our knowledge, our self-knowledge of emotions and how we operate is going to help us with understanding and appreciating how others operate emotionally as well. All right, so that leads us to, those are our six competencies that underlie and support the coaching dimension of our transformational leadership model. Now we're ready for your questions. So please feel free to type them into the either the Q&A box or the, uh, the chat box is actually, I've got the chat box open on my screen and would, would love to hear from you via the, uh, via the chat box. Uh, so, um, okay, so uh, uh, <laughs> what if a manager refuses to coach their employees? And this, this can happen, you know, we've got, we've got people who are, uh, who are, are quite, um, uh, quite resistant to taking more of a coach approach. They're feeling like, it, well, it takes time, it takes effort. Can I just tell people what to do? And really, you can. Um, and, and the work will likely get done, but what it does is it do, it's not an intentional move in our, our evolutionary direction. So again, we're wanting to evolve towards more intentional relationships with people, more intentional collaboration, more participative leadership, uh, and telling people what to do is, um, uh, is moving in the opposite direction, or at least standing still. It's not intentionally evolving. So what if a manager does refuses to coach their employees? Well, uh, that becomes a performance issue for that manager's um, leader. So now it's, there's a, a performance management issue, and, uh, and someone has to have a performance management conversation with that manager. And again, hopefully they take a coach approach with them and coach them around how they can transition towards more of a coach approach. So I've got another, one, another question here. How do you teach the person in the highest position in the company emotional intelligence if, uh, if he is not receptive to that, <laughs> well, that's, it's a great question. And we get this question frequently. Uh, and um, 
uh, sometimes it, uh, it it unfortunately leads me to to, uh, to to tell the 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 joke about how many psychologists does it take to change a light bulb? And you've probably heard this before. Uh, and the answer is one, but the light bulb has to want to change. Uh, and really, teaching a, a person who is in a position of authority in, in an organization about emotional intelligence and and its importance to the organization uh, can be done, uh, and it can be done by pointing out by having a, an assertive conversation uh, and talking about the evidence that, um, uh, or the impact rather of that individual's behavior or the behavior of others who are not being emotionally intelligent. Uh, and perhaps that is, uh, must be put into language that that person understands and is about something that that person, that it is important to that person. For example, uh, turnover. People leave companies where emotional intelligence is not uh, is not uh, embraced and, and thought of highly, uh, and um, uh, they don't want to be there. And it, it's not it's not attracting. Uh, it, it has difficulty with attracting top talent. You'll find employee engagement scores lower in organizations where the the highest person in the in the company uh, is not receptive or open to emotional intelligence. Uh, and really, you know, when you say that, then you're you're kind of indicating that that there are some behaviors behaviors that that person is displaying as well. Uh, and uh, so maybe it's about um, someone having a sort of conversation with that, with that person. Again, we're talking about speaking truth to power, which is never easy, uh, often a difficult thing to do. Uh, and so we have to find ways of doing that. And, and, and it's difficult. Uh, I'm not saying it's easy. It's, it, it is absolutely challenging. Uh, and it, it's, a, it's a very long answer to, uh, to a short question. Uh, to say that uh, there there are strategies and tactics that you can employ when the highest person in the in the company is not receptive to emotional intelligence, but it's not easy. Absolutely, it's challenging. So um, uh, so here, here's a, another question uh, around: um, Is coaching different from performance management? Uh, and uh, and absolutely it is. So so thank you for that question. So so the so. When we're talking about coaching, we are we're talking about thinking of how you can interact with employees uh, in a in a more general sense. So um, so these these are conversations in the hallway, conversations in team meetings, etc., where you are collaborating with them to improve performance. So when someone comes again with a challenge, an issue, or a concern, or a question, um, the, our first uh, the, our first you know, thought in a coach approach is to sort of turn it around uh, and and ask them what their thoughts are uh, on the issue. Uh, again, the assumption that they they know the solution in many cases, uh, and sometimes if it is a technical piece that they just don't have, then give it to them and move on. So we, we do want what is expedient. We're not arguing for inefficiency here. We're arguing for the benefits of a coach approach. That again, it's about respecting and allowing people the dignity to come up with their own solutions uh, and um, uh, and form a more collaborative relationship with everyone. Performance management is when someone is not doing what they should be doing, or they're doing something that they should not be doing, and and that that's an assertive. Uh, conversation. We can point to other EQ competencies that are critical and important in the performance management conversation, but it does have a very specific role in confronting, uh, in addressing, uh, in talking about the elephant in the room in some cases. Um, uh, but performance management is you are not working to, to the standard expected, uh, and uh, so changes must be made. So, so there, and, and there are effective ways to have that conversation, and there are ineffective ways to have that conversation. Okay, we've got another question. Studies show that women who are assertive are perceived more negatively than men who are assertive. What advice do you have for women who want to assert themselves as leaders while accounting for our cultural and social bias against women being assertive? Uh, great question, and uh, certainly it is the, one of the reasons why we have a, an entire three-day course for women, um, uh, and, and we call that one the heart and science of leadership. Uh, and then we've decided to, to offer it specifically for women because women and men are socialized differently. Uh, that uh, gender socialization in our society means that women who are assertive are, are sometimes, you know, um, uh, thought of as, uh, you know, being the B word, and men who are assertive are thought of as good leaders. 
Uh, and so, you know, societally, we need to we need to adjust that uh, that perspective and that thought. Uh, and uh, so, advice for women who want to assert themselves as leaders: uh, again, uh, you know, find find ways that um, uh, that uh, uh, find ways of being assertive that that work and fit for your particular situation and environment. Accounting for cultural and social biases against women being assertive. Yeah, I, again, there are there are good ways of doing that, and we have some great models uh, in our courses. One of which is our assertiveness model, which we've reviewed on various webinars previously. But you know, learning a good assertive way of being assertive that is not rude, it's not uh, insubordinate, uh, it's certainly culturally appropriate. Uh, I think there are ways to do that and, and, uh, and continue, to, continue to do that. Uh, and, uh, and uh, yeah, and allow you know, women to talk with other women about the difficulties of being assertive, et cetera. Uh, and uh, again, it's um, you know a bit of promotion, but but check out the, the Heart and Science of Leadership for Women, fantastic uh, venue for for discussing and talking about these issues. Uh, what if a manager doesn't like people? How are they going to coach? Yeah, good question. <laughs> you know, from time to time, you know, we we have managers that really, again, like this 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 one that was referred to earlier, the one who's the highest position in the company, and and you know, doesn't believe that emotional intelligence is, is important and, and feels that, you know, more traditional ways of, of, of leading people should be effective. And, you know, we, we hear this from time to time, you know, we pay them well, why, why you know, they should just do what we say. Uh, and yes, you do pay them well, and you, they should do what you, what you say. Uh, and, um, uh, and yet, the world is changing. We are becoming uh, more connected. We, we are becoming um, uh, more, uh, we, we desire more. We, as we learn about more, we desire more. And this is one of the, one of the, the parts of, uh, of technology is that as technology spreads around the globe and people learn more about what is possible, they want more. Uh, and we want to talk about things that matter. We, again, we want significant relationships with others. We don't want uh, su superficial relationships. And again, I always add when I talk about these things, and I assume that people want them, is that um, uh, people uh, almost everywhere, whether they know it or not, uh, want more. Um, in their relationships and their communication with others. And so if a manager doesn't like people, uh, then you know that certainly that's going to make it difficult. And, and it's also suggestive of, of a manager having uh, their own various issues that they should probably address. And, uh, and this is where, uh, this is where third party coaching comes in and third party coaching is excellent for managers in workplaces who probably should work on other things in order to improve their leadership effectiveness. Uh, and, uh, so, so it is about, uh, probably someone taking a performance management, uh, approach with that manager uh, and saying, wow, you know, and uh, here's the evidence. People, you know, are complaining about how you treat them. Uh, it, it's almost as if you don't like people and then maybe taking a more a, a direct approach, assertive approach and addressing that. So, so that's, that, that might be, um, uh, that, that might be an approach. Okay, so r with respect to coaching, here's a, another question. What if an employee only responds to threats? And, uh, and, and, and you know, there, there is, and we, we talk about this frequently with respect to workplace performance, there's the carrot and there's the stick. The proverbial carrot uh, is all about the, um, the inducement or the enticement, and the, uh, the proverbial stick is all about the uh, is, is all about the the, the threat, the uh, the sanction. Uh, what's going to happen if you don't? Uh, and um, and we sometimes feel that, that that employees maybe only respond to threats. Uh, and and again, I would probably take a more more of a performance management approach to this type of situation. Uh, and uh, uh, and I would want to work with the manager who's encountering this this employee. And coach coach them around various uh, various strategies and tactics to um, uh, and to improve their ability to coach uh, and also want to be really empathic with this manager uh, and say wow it must be really tough to have an employee that seems to only respond to threats 
uh, they must be very difficult to work with. Uh, and if you're if if you're constantly reminding them that uh, that their job is on the line or that that, that they're going to be fired, um, then um, uh, then then that's an interesting uh, situation as well and and difficult. Uh, and uh, okay, here's uh, okay. So is coaching the new mentorship? Uh, and, and of course, um, you know, w these are words that we use coaching and mentoring are sometimes spoken about together. I would, I would expect that the mentoring would be seen as, and again, it's, you know, w which meaning do you attach to mentoring versus coaching? Uh, that mentoring is, is more of a, um, uh, more of a, you know, this is, uh, I I've been there before you. And so I'm going to uh, sort of, you know, tell you a little bit about my experience in, in having been there before you. And we're going to sort of take that approach. But, you know, a lot of people use the, the terms um, uh, men, mentoring and coaching uh, as interchangeable. Uh, I think they're a little bit different that really with the coach approach, again, there's a little bit more of this appreciation for what the other person brings to the table. And with mentoring, it perhaps is a little bit clearer understood uh, that the person has not had the experiences of the mentor. So, uh, okay. Um, as uh, another question, if I've done, if I've taken the EQI, but not the leadership report or the EQ360, should I do the leadership report or the EQ360? And, uh, and the answer is uh, that, that we do have various reports, uh, as you may or may not know. So the workplace report doesn't have the gold bars on it and doesn't put all of the language of EQ uh, into leadership language. It's more general. So if your focus is team development or team effectiveness training, then maybe you want to consider the workplace report if the, uh, if the objective is all about leadership effectiveness, then, um, uh, then absolutely you may want to, uh, to use the leadership report. Uh, and uh, for those of you who have taken the workplace report, uh, and would like to see your your or would like to take it again and uh, and uh, and get a leadership report to, with to your results in it. Uh, by all means, we can uh, absolutely do that for you. We'll have a special price for you included in our follow up email uh, for the um, uh, for you to get your own leadership report. Now, for the 360, this is something that we highly encourage and recommend. If you have reports, if you are a leader in an organization, or you have your own small business and you'd just like to know more about uh, the comparison between your perspective on your EQ and the perspective of others. And it's always a fascinating look and a, and a great way to consider and look at, uh, at your EQ and to learn about that. All right, so um, we're going we're gonna to wrap up now, and uh, we'll do a bit of a summary. Uh, and so uh, for, for the summary, you know, what I really wanted you to take away from today is that coaching is how we interact with others. Uh, and really, you know, the, uh, the reasons for coaching are the result and, and the impact. Uh, we're talking about greater partnership. We're talking about greater collaboration. Uh, we're talking about um, the results uh, like trust, loyalty, commitment, and employee engagement, all of which are critical and important to the success and effectiveness of organizations. Um, the other thing I was hoping to, uh, to get across for you today was that EQ competencies provide the foundation for effective coaching uh, as a leadership behavior. Uh, and it would be important to consider those six EQ competencies when assessing a leader's ability to coach. To improve coaching effectiveness, focus on self-actualization. First and foremost, with all of our dimensions, are you in the right role? Are you doing what absolutely gets you excited to get out of bed every morning? Empathy, reality testing, interpersonal relationships, assertiveness, emotional self-awareness. Okay, so thank you for being with us today and watching this webinar. Uh, watch for a follow-up email from us. Um, uh, and consider joining us for one of the following. We've got our regular EQI 2.0 EQ360 certification courses running in cities across the country. Uh, next week is Calgary, week after is Toronto. Um, look for the heart and science of leadership for women coming up in a, in a city near you. Consider taking the EQI 2.0 or the EQ360. Consider getting coaching. 
hire one of our fantastic EQ coaches, people that uh, are across the country. We work in both official languages. Also, if you see this webinar, and ask for our $100 off coupon for any of the above, and we'll, we'll certainly email the more information about how to access those to anyone who has registered for this webinar. And let us know how you, what you think of the webinars. What, what other topics would you like to see us cover? What questions do we have, and, or what questions do you have for us? And certainly, if, uh, uh, if you'd like to have us uh, come and work with your organization, we are so happy to have those discussions as well. Uh, so thank you again, everyone, for being here. Uh, it's been um, it, it's always a pleasure. I do I did go through the regist registrations this morning, and it's so great to see so many of our dedicated uh, people registering for our webinars and uh, uh, and our our, our committed uh, uh, partners and uh, uh, and so many new names as well that we have not yet gotten the opportunity to and the privilege to know, and uh, we look forward to that. So thank you, everyone, uh, and we will uh, sign off for today and look forward to seeing you uh, join us on one of our future webinars. So have a great day, everyone, and thanks for being here. Bye for now. Nice work.